Brownie, brownie. Pretty, pretty puppy, yes. So pretty. That picture you sent me, that face is so pretty. That's why like when we take her out, yeah. like on campus. Yeah, oh yeah, she's pretty. Okay, we're ready to start. Okay, if you were here early, you met Brownie. It was uh, you phase. Is it roommate? Is she yeah. your roommate? And she's graduated though already. Or, she's actually in the vet tech. Oh, she's in the vet tech program. Yeah, because I used to be her advisor. Anyway, Brownie was a German Shepherd. I think I sent you a picture uh, last night, and it was a great example of a dog that was kind of anxious. And uh, if when you were if you were here, you saw it. If you walk up to the dog, where every time somebody came in, it would like bark and maybe even maybe. Some people were interpreting it as it was snipping at people. I don't know if it was. Somebody said out in the hallway it snipped at people. Not, it didn't bite anybody. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, but I could tell as soon as I saw the dog that it wasn't vicious, it wasn't going to bite anybody, and I actually kneeled down and it came over and I talked to her a little bit, and then she gave me a kiss. And some of the people in the business office go, That dog gave you a kiss? Well, you know. You, but you know you can't be intimidated. But it was it was going to be too much, too much barking, and uh, you know some people have a little phobia, and it wasn't it wasn't going to work out well. But they, the dog Brownie, got a bull fizzle, so make sure you send send me a picture of that. So it's it's a learning thing. The more dogs you meet, the more things you see, the more things you learn. And again, I'll reiterate, like with any dog, you let it come up to you. Don't even walk up to it, you know, ignore it, let it smell you. Uh, never put your face down, never say anything loud or fast movements, you know, because you never know um, what can happen. And so it's just, it's a learning thing, but it just wasn't gonna work out for all of us in this room. If it would have been just the 20 that were here, I would have kept the dog here. It would have been easy to say, yeah, because we would all have been sitting, she would have been walking around, she would have been fine with their 20, but with all this in and out, it wasn't gonna work, so. But tomorrow we have a puppy coming, so that'll work out pretty good, so, you know, whatever. Yesterday I had a Basset hound in my afternoon class. He was fun. His name was JT, and he, uh, you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, Colleen is the owner's name, and I go, uh, Colleen, um, does JT have his testicles? Because he had like a little sack. And, and she reminded me, she goes, Rod, you have his testicles. I have his testicles from last year. She, she was in another class and he was being castrated or neutered. And so <clears throat> she brought the testicles for me. I can't remember if I, I know, I, I think I dissected one ear. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was, this, it was 230. Yeah, yeah, he was small. Um, did I dissect one of the testicles, do you remember? I think I probably cut one open or something. So then I probably discarded them. I didn't keep them in formula. Anyway, it's so fun. So yeah, that's it's a it's a good learning thing. So we had a, a good experience this morning with Brownie. I really would have liked to kept her around, but you got, you got to think of the whole picture. So anyway, there's some uh, questions on this sheet. So let me talk about that for a minute. This assessment sheet. It's not required at all. In fact, don't do it if you don't want to. If you're confident that you're circling the right uh, answer on your test or assessment question, then you don't have to, do. this is just like, since I don't do Blackboard, if you want to check sometime, you can check five weeks from now, if you want to, and I, you might say, why do I put A1 over there? That's how they're in the spreadsheet, you know, I record the latest grade when it goes out that way. So right now you have what, four, right? You could, you could write in four points, not percentages. So it's the number of questions right times two, you would write in there, right? So. You know, a lot of times the max is 52 or 54 or 50, whatever. Don't put in 80 because you're thinking percent. No, it's points. You don't have to hand it in. If you want to, there's always some in the back uh, cabinet. We'll just keep the supply there. And if you do fill it out, you put your name there, put whatever you got in there, fold it in half, and then you can set it right here. And then, like, I can check on the spreadsheet and then Whenever I, the next time I see you in class, I'll, they'll just be spread out here, okay? So, you can check if you want, it's not required. It's just if you want to check, <coughs> every once in a while, like there's a two point difference, somebody didn't, 
Like the last assessment from four last week, somebody didn't do one question, didn't fill in one. <coughs> so that's wrong, but maybe on their assessment, they circled C, see what I mean? And it might be right on their assessment that they left the room with, but it's wrong on the sheet because they didn't fill anything out. That happens once in a while, not very often. So that's that. Anybody got any questions on that sheet? You don't have to do them. You can do them later when there's more, whatever. Okay. So let me go back to the PC here. <clears throat> and we're doing immunology. So, man, what a topic. The videos are pretty good. He egotistically says no. Anyway. Um, Immunology is an interesting topic. It's like deep as any well could ever be. But we start with the, um, the basics. And what's kind of neat is, I don't know if you, I, I sent out an email last night that some, some of the people that got 100% uh, on last week's assessment, I have it on the analysis page. Let me see if that came out because um, what happened was, uh, when I was copy pasting, okay, it didn't come up too bad. Yeah, I couldn't get rid of that white stuff. That doesn't mean anything. It's just when my computer program. Anyway, it's a bunch of students that are saying, responding to, you know, how much of this did you learn in the past? Because I don't, you know, we're like there's 90 in the room. The best thing for me would be to pick your brain and know exactly how much biology you have. Okay. I can't do it, so then I'm kind of aiming for, I don't know if it's the average or whatever, but I'm aiming for the content that we delivered for 2.30. Um, there was a very famous educational psychologist, and somebody asked him, I think it was David Ozabel. Anyway, somebody asked him if he could boil down learning and learning theory to just like the essence, what would you, what would you say? And here's what he said, and it's very amazing ascertain what the student knows and teach him accordingly. But him is a generic him. So what that means is for a student, ascertain what they know and then teach them accordingly. Because in learning theory, think of it as, as a sphere. Let's say you, you know this much about DNA or fat cells. The next appropriate thing to learn is the next stuff like the air right beside what you already know. Uh, and there was a famous Russian guy, uh, and I can't remember, it's called the Zone of Proximal, what is it? Development. Development? development. Okay. The Zone of uh, proc, uh, Proximal Development. That means if a learner knows this much, then teach them the next stuff to learn. Or if their thing is this big, then teach them still that zone in there. <laughs> so you all have different zones. You know. Maybe you flew through biology 110, 111, and you have an incredible background, but maybe you struggled and it's not as big as the neighbor, right? And so it's all that stuff and we're faced with that. But anyway, the people that made the comments, it's very interesting. Read it, it's good. Okay, so now, back to immunology. So that's, uh, that worked out, but it wasn't perfect. Sometimes immunology can be depicted as a double-edged sword, and that's very appropriate. That means if you swing it one way, you'll cut something like your enemy. But if it swings back, it cuts you. <coughs> so it can do real good, or it can kill you. That's the immune system. Kind of freaky, but it can kill you. There are autoimmune diseases that people have and animals have, and people die from it every day, the immune system going wacko. If the, if the immune system thinks some of your cells shouldn't be there, they attack them, whether they're healthy or not. And that's this whole thing about autoimmunity. It's crazy. But it can protect you from diseases, right? So that's the blade is swinging that way, that's good, but it can kill you. So it's really funky if things go bad. Um, so then there's another concept I know, I'm sure it was in the videos, self versus non-self. Your immune system, at least part of it, has to be trained what's good, what's self, and then what's non-self. 
and whatever is cell <coughs> shouldn't be attacked. So a good immune system knows that your skin cells or your pancreas is good and it won't attack it. Then anything foreign coming in is non-self and it's attacked. Like if you get a skin graft from another person and you didn't do any tissue matching, then that skin graft would be rejected because the immune system is going to fight it. And that's this whole thing about tissue matching. You know, you, they, somebody's looking for a kidney or bone marrow, it's gotta be a match. Or it doesn't have to be a perfect match because matching can be very poor match and the tissue would be rejected. But here's a great match and the tissue would be accepted, like maybe identical twins, right? They're, they're the same, they look the same. So the identical twin could give a kidney without even doing any matching because it's the same individual basically. So you can have a real good match where nothing will be rejected and then you can have something in the middle. And I don't know how they do it for well, like when they transplant kidneys. I don't know how much of a match they have to have. It's never gonna be perfect, but maybe if it's like close, then they can do the kidney uh, transplant. But it, it, obviously if it's bad, then they can't. So this whole thing about tissue matching is basically, is the person, the recipient's immune system gonna attack the skin or the kidney or whatever? And there's tissue matching, it's called. Okay, so that's a couple things to think about. So then, um, I want to talk a little bit about lymph nodes. So maybe I'll start here, and I'm going to draw something on the screen, on the document cam too. <clears throat> we did talk about the lymph system, but I can't remember exactly how much we talked about lymph nodes. And so let me go to the document cam, and then I'll get back to that, those pictures. Be doing my Google thing, I still have trouble with. Uh, Chrome, I can't get Chrome started, and some of the people didn't help me, I guess. So, okay, so I'm gonna draw this, and I'm just gonna draw a blood vessel. And refresh our memory. Here's an artery bringing blood into a capillary bed. The capillary bed I'm gonna do in, uh, you know, it branches out, so let me do this. That means it's branching. And then on the venous side, I'll do blue. So that depicts um, deoxygenated blood. So here's my picture so far. Arterial blood, so you have our large artery, like the aorta artery, an arterial capillary bed, and then this would be a vein wheel, right? And then, supposedly, on this end, there's 100 drops of blood fluid comes out. Fluid, but no cells. And then near this end, 99 go back. So, so make sure you know this process. This comes out because of hydrostatic pressure, blood pressure, basically expelling fluid out of pores, pores. This comes back in because of osmotic pressure, not blood pressure, okay? Because this end is very low pressure, right? High pressure, low pressure. Now we've got this one and over time, it will accumulate another one, and another one, and another one, and the tissues could swell. And what's it called when a tissue swells because of excess fluid collection? Edema. Edema. So if this existed only, then you'd have edema. But there is, luckily, and I'm running out of colors, I'll just make it black. Over here, <coughs> is a tube that starts. Now that's kind of weird, but it's a tube that starts in that tissue. So it's blind ended on one end, you know, it's a, there's a, I don't want to say a cap, but it's a tube that starts. And that's the lymph system. So over time, that one drop will be over here. And now let me make this bigger, because I'm going to put a valve in here. So that's a one-way valve. And then there's another lymph vessel here. I'm drawing a pair, but that's okay. Then I'm gonna make a node right here. <laughs> so now what I've snuck in is a big lymph node. <laughs> and so 
the excess fluid, the extra interstitial fluid, will get picked up by this lymph vessel. This lymph vessel isn't solid. It's like flaps of cells, and fluid can be forced in a flap. And when the with fluid in the lymph vessel wants to come back, the flaps kind of shut. So fluid can be forced in here, and it's kind of hard to get out. And then through the body's movement, then the fluid, the lymph now it's called, starts heading back towards the heart, but it goes through a lymph node. So that big thing there is a lymph node. And there'd be other inputs. Okay, and we'll look at some of that. So what you could call this is an afferent lymph vessel. A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, -E -E afferent meaning incoming. So a lymph node has many afferent lymph vessels bringing fluid in. Okay. And then it has one efferent lymph vessel. Afferents, one efferent. E. So there's my scratching, efferent, means outgoing. Many in, one out usually. And then this lymph node, sorry I didn't put the E there, not nod, but node. A lot of white blood cells live in the lymph node, so it's a hotel for white blood cells, leukocytes. Now what's interesting about these um, areas that it's draining, and I'll show you a diagram. It's called a drain field. <coughs> like, here's the lymph node, and if you know your anatomy, you can say, oh, that lymph node there in that region of the body, its drain field is over here or over there. It's not always close by. It's really kind of weird. There's a lymph node in people, humans, that's like right up in this re region of the neck. It actually drains some of the abdominal cavity which is funky. Here's the kicker. Lymph nodes are hotels for white blood cells, but they can enlarge. If you get the flu this winter, your glands are enlarged, right? Those are lymph nodes. Anytime a lymph node enlarges, that means the white blood cells are fighting something. Because when they get exposed to non-self, Somebody goes, one, lift, one uh, white blood cell goes, I'm gonna multiply to two, I need help. So two go to four, four go to eight, so forth and so on, and if everybody does that, pretty soon the lymph node swells. That's why lymph nodes enlarge, Mo mainly. It's not the only reason, you know how we're giving general things, but in a lot of cases, a swollen lymph node is evidence of something non-self, and a lot of times that non-self is called an antigen. There's some of our A words, an antigen, A-N-T-I-G-E-N. I'm going to go just reset my camera while I'm remembering it. Hopefully the sound's going, but maybe not. I have to, but... Okay, so lymph nodes swell <laughs> when they encounter an antigen. So let me do that on my... Oh, good, I have green. Green is an antigen. There's green, I'm not sure if it's showing up. Sooner or later, that antigen will get into the lymph system. So an antigen is going to get in the lymph system, and it's going to get down to the lymph node, and then the white blood cells see it and fight it, if it's not a cell, okay? <clears throat> so the lymph node swells. So we, I introduced the concept of a drain field, and if you know a certain lymph node where it drains, what it's draining, then you look back at the drain field to see what's happening, right? Is it like a bacterial infection or what's going on upstream? So like, if that lymph node swells, you don't look at the lymph node so much, it's like, what's happening up here? What is it? What's going on up there? Okay, then, 
just to make that picture complete. This efferent lymph node, sooner or later, if you followed it, would lead back to the right atrium. All the lymph that's made in the body is going back and getting into bigger, bigger vessels, and they dump into the right atrium, essentially. So then that fluid gets back into the blood, right? So then you're not losing it, because if it was dripping on the floor, then sooner or later you'd run out of fluid and you'd dehydrate, right? So you conserve all that water, but lymph does not circulate in the body. It's made and goes to the heart. Blood circulates, right? Lymph does not. So if somebody says lymph circulates, no, it's made here, goes, gets back into the body, the blood. That's a one-way track. That's not circulating. Okay, so then let me look at some of these neat pictures. And I'll show you what I uh, uh, searched for. And you could do this with our textbook, right, or Google. Up on, on the top, I said lymph nodes dog. And then I clicked on images. I knew I'd find image. And then we're going to go to an, uh, an image and look at how they named lymph nodes. Well, let's see, here's one. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. Now I've learned how, okay, that's good. Okay, lymph node structure, anatomy. Kind of like mine, but better. But here's the incoming afferent lymphatic vessels. And see, if you know your stuff, you can look at any image and see if they did it right. A for incoming from it. And then, you know, there's different regions of lymph node, but then here's the efferent lymph vessel, and then they also have a node artery and a node, node vein. Because every lymph node has an afferent blood supply. Look at how I can use those terms. Afferent blood supply and efferent blood supply, right? Usually only attached in this one region here. Not Blood vessels don't ever come around here. There's the valve system. I mean, so they did a great job, okay? Sometimes, uh, and then look at here, they're saying in the cortex, which is the, let's say the outer ring of tissue, <coughs> it has B and T cells, we'll find that out if you watch the videos. And then the medulla tends to have more, have some of these lymphocytes and then macrophages. So there's something we can add. What lives in the lymph node? B cells, T cells, and macrophages. Question? Is fluid picked up by the lymph vessels also by osmotic pressure? Um, well, back at the, at the, you know, where the lymphatic starts, it can be some um, osmotic pressure, but it's also uh, basically fluid pressure because the fluid pressure outside the lymph vessel is probably a little higher than inside the lymph vessel, and it's kind of like the water will just go because of hydrostatic pressure, basically. And those, all those vessels aren't like a solid pipe. They're like flaps of tissue. And so like if this is the inside of a lymph vessel, this little cell will let some fluid in, but then when it wants to flow out, it goes like this. And then muscle movements tend to take the lymph back and follow with the blood vessels. Anyway, so, yeah, question. Did you take out a lymph node? Uh, would, like, could, would the others compensate for the missing lymph node? Like, if you had to extract a lymph node, like, is right. that like a kidney concept that, like, when you take out a kidney, the kidney gets bigger and it mm -hmm. compensates, mm -hmm. or could you, like, do that with lymph nodes, too? Well, there's probably some uh, overlap on drain fields. So, you know, maybe a certain area gets drained by a couple. But um, usually, I don't think, if you take out one lymph node, the surrounding ones usually would not enlarge, I don't think. Okay. You, know, uh, you made a point about a kidney. If you take out a kidney, especially in a young animal, the contralateral kidney will enlarge, you know, try to do the job of the original. But in lymph nodes, I do not think that happens. Okay? Good question. Okay, so then, lymph nodes, dog, back here. Let's look at this picture here. I think it enlarges. And then, yeah, okay. So there are these lymph nodes scattered throughout the body, and I guess I probably should have looked at a little dimmer here. Sorry about that, come on, back up, no. Okay, so you can see the drain fields and all the lymphatics, because there'd be a lymph vessel in every tissue, basically. Um, 
and they're kind of neat, but this one's kind of neat. You might want to write this down, popliteal. It's in the rear part of the, each leg, P-O-P-L-I-T-E-A-L, popliteal node, and you can feel that on, you know, like especially a big dog. And if you ever take your dog or you go to a physician or a dog goes to a veterinarian, a lot of times there's palpation, looking for enlarged structures, looking for enlarged thyroid, looking for an enlarged popliteal node. Because if it's enlarged, that means it's fighting something. Okay? Usually. Okay? So there, like that just gives you an idea of what the whole thing looks like. Okay, so then, get rid of that and see what else did I do here. Question back here. So what is the purpose of a popliteal node? Uh, it, dra it, it drains that area of the leg okay. and then sends that lymph back to the heart, right? I mean, they're, they're scattered all through the whole body and every place they are, they drain a certain region and then they're kind of monitoring, right, for antigens. So then they search drain field of lymph nodes just to show you how you can look these up. And I just want to show you this one about the stomach because it's kind of neat, even the stomach has different areas where, where they're being drained, okay? So, uh, and they, they use green, that's pretty neat. So like this area of the stomach is drained here, uh, it's drained here, and then it's all gonna go back to bigger and bigger vessels and then dump into the right atrium, right? All this lymph that's being made. Uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest producer of lymph is the liver. The liver, it's estimated, makes 50% of all the lymph in the body. And when we do liver, it's amazing. The liver, you know how most organs have an afferent blood supply and then an efferent one, right? A kidney has a, there's a renal artery and a renal vein. Do you know the liver has two afferent blood vessels? Two big vessels bringing blood in, okay? And so there's a lot of blood flowing through the liver and it makes, it filters a lot of stuff and it makes a lot of lymph and it sends this lymph back to the heart. And what's kind of interesting is if the liver has some problems with how much fluid is coming through and it can't get rid of all of it, sometimes the liver weeps, W-E-E-P-S, or weeping liver. The liver actually on its surface will have fluid coming out of it. It's got so much fluid coming to it, it and it can't get rid of it, it's called a weeping liver. And then that water collects in the abdominal cavity. Because if a liver weeps, it's in the abdominal cavity, right? And it's going to collect. So if you have a weeping liver, would that be after like a demon's draining? Well, no, if that would be something different than edema because edema is back in the tissue someplace. This would not, that would not be called edema because it's being expressed out of the surface of the liver. So would you have it after it just has gone down to the liver? Uh, no. Uh -uh. You know, you could have edema and you could have a weeping liver, or you could have no edema and a weeping liver. The kicker is the liver has so many, so much fluid coming into it. If something goes wrong, you can have a weeping liver and the fluid collects in the abdominal cavity. Okay, now let's do a couple some words. So I think you got the idea of a drain field. It's well known if you study anatomy. Uh, you you got to know where these things are at. Uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. So this is mostly human, but you get the idea. I want to do some more A words. Okay, so let me do, and oh, I know what. Well, I have this here. I was going to tell you, um, remember how last week we talked about ELISAs, where you can make antibodies that recognize a hormone? I was going to give a shout out to two guys that used to send me antibodies. And I searched, so it's kind of a shout out to them. I see out there, Terry Nett, Colorado State University. He used to send me, when I had an endocrine lab, antibodies that would recognize bovine LH. And they would, it would come life alive. That means all the foods out of it, you know, it's kind of like freeze dried, life alive. But what's amazing, what I was gonna tell you about those antibodies, I mean, so he raised them, I can't remember what, if it was rabbits or whatever, but 
that bottle could sit in my freezer for 10 years and then I could reconstitute it with water and the antibodies would work. Amazing. I mean, it's amazing. And anyway, so Terry Nett, and then the other guy I was gonna tell you about, so he's a, a fabulous stuff with endocrinology and immunology. But here's the sad thing. I was gonna give a shout out to Gordon Nicewinder, who also was out of Colorado, and he passed away this March 24th. I did not realize that. So, I mean, those two guys were like, God send. If you were working with like cattle and hormones and, and needed antibodies, they were so kind to send out these antibodies and uh, they were terrific. So now, let me do my one look dictionary and do some A words. Let's do antigen. Okay. Oh, okay. So now sometimes these definitions aren't the best. It says a harmful substance that causes your body to produce antibodies to fight against it. Let's say a substance that causes your body to produce antibodies. That's better. Because some antigens aren't harmful. Okay? So a substance. So an antigen is something foreign. An antigen is non-self. But here's what you should know. You can be a really good antigen, or you can be a very poor antigen. And there's like this whole <coughs> stepwise fashion. So here's over here is a real good antigen. That means you inject a little into a body, and the immune system goes wacko. It goes, wow, I'm going to fight you, and you get a good response. An antigen can be a very poor antigen. That means you can inject it into the body, and the body might say, oh, I don't feel like fighting you. I'm not going to work against you. I'm not going to make antibodies against you. So there's this whole thing, this whole range. So antigens can be different. It can be a really good antigen, that means you get a good immune response, but an antigen can be very poor and you get a very poor response. So whenever you inject an um, animal with a vaccine, a vaccine is an antigen. A vaccine contains antigens. Yes? With what? With size. Size, molecular size of the, of the antigen. Yes, there's a whole bunch of things. Size of the antigen is a factor, not the only factor. It's just not, because you can have a big antigen, it might still be a poor antigen. But in general, a bigger substance is more recognizable by the immune system, yeah. But there's other factors and another class that goes into it deeper. The thing is, there's this whole gradation. <coughs> So if you're injecting a vaccine into the animal, you want it to be a good antigen, right? If you inject a poor antigen in, you might not get much of an immune response. If an antigen isn't even noticed and doesn't amount an immune response, it's called a hapten, H-A-P-T-E-N. So the idea of antigens are <coughs> non-self. Let's do um, hapten, see what it says. <coughs> And let's see. Okay. I'm not sure which one's the good one here. Let's see what we've got. Um, okay, so yeah, here it is. Here's the definition for happen that you should write down. The happen alone will not induce an immune response. Okay? So it's like a small molecule. It's kind of, you know, it's an antigen, but it's so small that it doesn't mount an immune response. But you can make antibodies against haptins. So what you do, like Gordon and Terry, my buddies, um, they would attach a haptin to a bigger molecule and then inject it into the animal. And then you would get an immune response. So let me, let me show you that on a document, on the document can here. So a haptin is a small thing that doesn't make an immune response. So here's a haptin right there. If you inject those into the cow, the cow wouldn't mount an immune response. But how would you make it mount an immune response? You would attach that haptin to a bigger molecule. And then inject it in the animal. And then 
Antibodies are directed against certain areas on an antigen called uh, epitopes. Some place in your reading, whatever, epitope. So epitopes are places on the surface of an antigen that antibodies are directed against. So some of the antibodies that the, let's say, cow makes against this is going to attach here. So there's like some epitope there. I'll make it uh, red, not the red blood cell. Anyway, <clears throat> but lo and behold, some of the antibodies are going to be directed against this haptic. Okay, and then you, there's ways to isolate antibodies. So you could connect the haptin to a bigger molecule and then get an immune response against the haptin. An epitope is a region on the antigen that the antibodies are directed against. So let me, let me just end with that. Let me type in epitope. E-P-I-T-O-P-E. Sorry, I'm spelling epitope, I'm finding one. The second Come on. Come on, here's epitope. That part of an antigenic molecule in which antibodies are being that's the good way to say it. Epitope. So a real good antigen would have many epitopes. See you. I guess we're staying here too. Some of us are staying. <laughs>